This is the Obscurity to Authority Podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. I am here with our next guest, Kevin Macko. How are you doing, Kevin? Hey, Darren. Happy to be on the show. Looking forward to it. Awesome, man. I'm excited to talk to you. You run a really interesting company. I'm excited to kind of share that with everyone today. Um, I know they're going to love it, especially because we have a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of business owners, a lot of creators, like I was kind of telling you off there. Um, you know, what you do is very interesting. It's very unique. Um, and so I'm kind of excited to expose that. So why don't we jump in and just have you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself, who you are, and this incredible company that you started. Sure. Yeah. Happy to. Uh, my name is Ken Mako of Mako Design. In a, in a real simple nutshell, we do product development at a professional level, design for production, for inventions, for the small folks. So that's inventors, small manufacturers, small e-commerce brands, and small hardware startups. And it's an end-to-end -end solution from sketch on a napkin through to design engineering prototyping, all the way through to full-scale production. So what made you want to start a business like this? Let's kind of take it back from a personal note and just kind of way back it. How did you get here? How did you get to that point where you thought this is the company you're going to start? Well, it's, it's a bit of a crazy story. It uh, started back in high school, back in 1999. And the reason that I got into this is because I had an invention idea. It's a you know, very simple, one of those business models that came out of a pain point that I had personally. So I had this invention idea. It was kind of wacky at the time. And I just was looking for somebody to design it. I wanted to prototype it and get it to production. It was as simple as that because really what I was looking forward to was selling this thing, this like vision, this dream I had in my head. I just wanted to sell it. Well, what I realized very quickly, especially back then, was that it was almost impossible for a small startup to get a product made at a world caliber class all the way from my idea through to production. And that was kind of the aha moment. I looked at it and I said, well, if I could fill that need, I mean, forget my, my silly little invention, I could help hundreds or thousands of people with their invention ideas to go from sketch to production. So it started just with that as an idea. And then I went to business school. So I was section class president at the Ivy Business School, which is Harvard Business School sister school up in Canada. And uh, I was class president there, so I'd pick my litter of jobs. But I actually ended up incorporating this halfway through university and then going overseas to Hong Kong University to study the other side of things, supply chain management uh, and manufacturing. And when I came back and graduated from both programs, I turned down the job offers to very reluctantly at the time, take a shot at this. And all the while begging and pleading with everybody, I said no to just say like, please crack the door open for me if I fail <laughs> as I come out of this because this is a long shot. And at the time, I was about $50,000 in student debt and I had maybe six weeks cash flow. And what I did for many years after that was basically play the game of getting a new customer in that would help pay the bills for a bit, float a little longer, and then start panicking as I got closer to going bankrupt again and get the next client in and so on. And I grew the business still to today, completely organically, no debt, no financing, no business partners, uh, to a 30 person team with four offices from coast to coast across the US and Canada. So all of that was completely organic, all just from an idea that I had starting back in high school. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, I think a lot of business owners can, can relate to that. I mean, that, that initial uncertainty, that initial fear, that initial like, oh my God, I have all this debt racking up. I don't know where my first customer is coming in. And also getting into that cycle of pushing and pushing and pushing for that customer. And all of a sudden that customer come in, comes in and you're like, oh my God, I got to fulfill this. I got to get to work. And you're diving into that. And then that project's done and you're like, oh wait, I need to fill another spot. And you're kind of bouncing back and forth. And so it's a very tricky spot, especially as you said, having $50,000 um, of debt from school coming in the door. I mean, that's, that's, that's crazy. I mean, that would have been a very tempting moment for a lot of people to raise capital and maybe try to get some float. But what prevented you from doing that? Maybe going out and taking on an investor or a partner? Were you against it? Was it just how it rolled out? Like, how was that decision process? I didn't even really think it was an option back then. So uh, to amplify the craziness of the story as well, keep in mind, this was, I graduated at the end of 2007. So here I am bright eyed and bushy tailed and I have this great idea and I've incorporated and I started to get some early clients and, uh, you know, I think, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. I started doing it out of the condo with a part-time industrial designer and bam, 2007 crash hits. 
So money just dried up across the board. It, it, it wasn't just for investors, it was for customers and potential customers that were looking to develop their next product, whether it was a small business or whether it was an inventor, everybody basically flatlined at that point in time and said, no, we're, we're saving our pennies. And in, you know, in addition to that, being a young entrepreneur in this space thinking, yeah, you know what, I'm going to create a world-class design firm tailored to the small folks. Every single design firm owner that I talk to or people in the industry unanimously, unanimously across the board, everybody told me, oh, Kevin, forget it. You, you don't work with inventors. You don't work with startups as a design firm. If you even get to half the size you want to be or half the caliber you want to be, uh, it, it would be impossible to do on startups. All design firms are, are basically paid for 90% plus by Fortune 500 product companies. The, everybody, we avoid inventors like the plague. And if you really need to, to pay the bill or whatever, sure, take one on, but then get to your big corporate customer. Now, what they didn't see it, and what I really saw as, as a movement happening was early stage development being a priority in the marketplace. So what ended up happening is Kickstarter and Indiegogo came in basically to help startups when they develop their product to actually get the product to market. You had this massive global entrepreneurial push happen where at the university and college levels, there was all these support infrastructures, including money. And I sit on the boards of a number of these places now for places that can actually help students get their product ideas commercialized. There's a hundred times more co-working spaces and incubation spaces now than there were when I started back in 1999 worldwide. So this massive emergence of young entrepreneurship happened, which was very good in the hardware space because what simultaneously happened is big Fortune 500 customers, those big product companies said, you know what, we're going to spend less money in R&D and we're going to spend more money in just acquiring these companies as they come out. So if you look at all these major brands, you know, like Nest Thermostat or Oculus Rift or whatever else, these were huge products that started from inventors, ended up getting to a certain point and then getting bought out and made a hundred times the size by their acquire. So it was a win-win for everybody all around. And I would say most of our clients at Maco Design that even hit the low seven figures in sales. So just getting the ball rolling, just starting to make some early sales traction, pretty much all of them get acquired and then partner up with these new mega companies that then take them to you know, exponentially larger heights. So it really is, um, you know, a part luck, part hard work, part craziness that the story went from that model back in high school, survived that 2007 crash, and then actually ended up being a, a big design house. Now we're the leading design house for startup hardware development. So that, that was all from an early idea in the early years. Wow. Yeah. See that that's incredible. And it, it's amazing that you spotted that trend and you can see that going in that direction. Like, did you know that as you were starting to found this company or were you just going into this? And as you went, you realized, Oh wow, we kind of hit the nail on the head here with timing because this is the way the market's going. You know, hind hindsight's 2020. It could look like and feel like I knew what I was doing in part. It was, you, you see sprinklings of it. And I really started to believe that, that the small folks were going to be a big part of the market. And also I, I didn't, I didn't care. I, I loved entrepreneurship. I was actively involved in the entrepreneurship clubs back at university. I was trying all these silly businesses but from even before high school. You know, that summer, all these, all these ideas that I had, and uh, some of them made a little money. Some of them just fell flat on their face. So I liked the idea of entrepreneurship, and I really liked the idea of helping the small folks. So I actually didn't care that much in the early days if the market trended the right direction. I still believed in the product that I was offering which was connecting inventors to market success for hardware products. So whether or not the industry emer emerged like it did, I really believed in helping that group of people. Now, of course, like I say, a bit of luck added to the equation because I could see some of the writing on the wall starting to happen, um, start of the some of the encouragement on entrepreneurship at that time. I just never thought it would grow to the size that it is now. And I still feel like we're at the tip of the iceberg. Really, hardware development um, is following quite a lot of what's happening in the software space, where you're, you're basically seeing the innovation happening at, at the garage tech level, and then going through multiple funding rounds to become billion dollar enterprises. A lot of that's happening in hardware. Look at Peloton as, a, as an example, right? So we're looking at companies that start small and work their way up very quickly and then have a whole a uh, bunch of support from the early phase support, whether it's colleges, universities, 
uh, angel investors, incubation spaces, maker spaces, hardware accelerators, you name it. There's a whole bunch of things happening at the early level. But in addition, there's big things happening at the financial institutional level, venture capital financing, series A, B, C raises, this stuff's starting to happen for hardware, especially if hardware is integrated at all with electronics. It doesn't even have to be anymore, right? If a hardware product is hot, it can be a big ticket uh, business. Yeah, yeah, 100% agree. Um, so when you have entrepreneurs now that maybe, or maybe not, not necessarily entrepreneurs, but people that want to become entrepreneurs, and maybe, because I mean, I bump into people like this all the time, you know, they're, they're sitting on a couch and they just, they have an idea, right? They hit with this idea and they're just, they're sure it's going to be huge if they can just figure out a way how to, how to get this going. They've never been in business. They have no entrepreneurial experience. They don't have a business background in school, but they have an idea and they think that it can work. Why don't we walk through that process a little bit? What should they be doing first? Who should they be going to? How should they be kind of navigating that initial process? You know, the first thing that I mentioned, whether it's a hardware product or anything else, uh, is just start and prioritize. One of the biggest things that I see, and I've worked with over a thousand clients just at our product development firm alone, let alone on all kinds of other boards and judging panels and whatever else. So I've seen a lot of startups try a lot of different ways. One of the easiest pieces of advice that I can give to anybody who's just at the early, early idea phase, no matter what the product or service is, is to just prioritize it every week. Even if you're just starting with two to four hours a week and with that, start at your highest priority items and just do it every week. So you, you carve out that time and you start to, maybe the first part is research or you want to make some calls or you want to sketch out the idea. I'm not telling you exactly what to do within the framework, but very few people out there will consistently and reliably work on their idea every week. And if you can be the one that just does that, you're already tilting the odds aggressively in your favor to all sorts of other people, the vast majority, which those ideas will always just be ideas or it'll be a pipe dream. But if you can just start working on it every week, don't need to quit your job, don't need to change your lifestyle, just put some effort in, maybe switch out watching TV uh, two nights a week to working on your big idea. That's the first step. And that's just a fundamental uh, way of changing the way you're thinking about your prioritization in your life and adding just a little bit of time to this. You, what you will find is over time, especially if you're focusing on the higher priority items first within your business idea, is that it, your idea will become more clear. It will become better flushed out. It will become better researched. And you will start to realize over time what your next steps are. And you will start pushing on those next steps if you continue to prioritize the most important thing. So that's number one. If you're looking at a product, a physical product itself, an invention idea, a gadget, whether it's an electronic, uh, like, you know, if I look at our clients, the underwater fishing camera or pet bot or whatever else, or whether it's something really simple, like our cheese sleeve or omelet spatula, <laughs> It doesn't matter what the idea is, but if you have that idea, know one thing in your mind first and foremost. In your lifetime, you're likely only to have one, maybe two, on the absolute outside, three good ideas. And that's in any business or any industry. If you waste that idea, you are wasting that once or twice in a lifetime opportunity. So, if you're trying, if you're struggling with my first piece of advice, which is how do I commit that four hours a week to actually focus on that? Remember the second piece of Intel is that it's extremely rare and extremely valuable when you see that piece of the marketplace that something is missing, whether it's an opportunity to improve someone's life or whether it's an opportunity to reduce a pain point. Either way, if you've identified something, and ideally you can do it in your own life, look for pain points of your own suffering or look for opportunities in your own world, whether it's at work or at home or with friends and family. From there, when you come up with something, when you realize that you've come up with something that really isn't out there, it's not done well, or there's a combination of things that would serve better, that is your golden ticket. So don't let that slide. Yeah, I 100% I agree. So going back to that, because I think I'm, I'm going to try to play the voice of the listener here. And um, I know there's a lot of people listening that have that idea. Uh, there's, there's two clear paths that I kind of see for, as an outsider, right? And it's, I have this idea, I can go one of two ways, you know, following that framework. I can choose to start by putting in my own time and I'm going to say, I'm going to research, I'm going to drop some sketches, I'm going to put that time on that. 
there's the other route of, I have no idea even what to be doing here. I, I don't even know how to research. I can't sketch. I just know that I have this idea. So I'm maybe going to go find uh, a partner. Do I go to an accelerator? Do I go to incubator? Should I, you know, how do they decide which path? Like if, I, if I'm going to get going, is there a more efficient path? Is it better to go your own way and push through? Or is it better to find that support system infrastructure and go in front of whether it's an incubator or accelerator and get that support from the get go? Or do you need to get to a certain point on your own first before that makes sense? That's a really good question. And it allows me to jump, jump into the details a bit with hardware. Hardware is pretty confusing because it's one of those things where if you just Google it, you're going to get a lot of confusing information, you know, from what big corporations are doing, which is absolutely different to what some person with an idea would do as they're starting to rough it together in their garage or whatnot. It's very difficult as a consumer to understand the path in hardware because it's, it's not really one of those fields. I mean, the, the typical field, it's called industrial design. And most people don't even know what that means. Industrial design is actually the merger of function and visual design. It's called industrial design. It's the design of physical things and products around us. And most people aren't even aware of the terminology because it's not really an industry that was ever kind of sexy or, or in the news a lot. It's obviously becoming more so right now. But that really wasn't the thing to how do inventions get materialized and come to life. And then there's all this confusing information because of, you know, movies made on people getting patents and fighting them in court and all this other stuff, which is, which is very unusual, very fringe scenarios uh, that happen. So to make it very clear on what an inventor has to do, the first and foremost thing you need to wrap your head around is if you have that invention idea, your sole goal is to get to production and sell at least just a few units to real users. That is it. There is no shortcut in product development. There is no, uh, you know, come up with an idea and get rich quick or sell the idea or whatever else. That almost never happens in my entire career of doing this. I have never seen a hardware startup come up with that idea, an idea and somehow make a million dollars. I have seen numerous hardware companies come up with an idea, develop it, get to production, start selling units, and then sell for millions of dollars. And that is the key difference. So whether you're even looking to license it at the end, or whether you're looking to sell your IP, or whether you're looking to partner with potentially a big manufacturer, or whether you're looking to produce and sell the product yourself and sell directly to consumers, or to sell through retailers, or to white label to other brands to sell on, or whatever channel or idea that, that may or, you, know, you may want to do, or that may evolve over time, all of those are with an underlying understanding that you need to be attempting to get to production. You need to be showing the pathway to production. So to, when you understand that, it doesn't mean that you have to have the money to go out and design an engineer and, and produce it. In fact, I would say half the clients that come to macro design don't have the money to take it all the way to production. But what you do have to be doing is thinking in the mentality is how do I get to production? And if you're on a limited budget, that means Maybe you can get to, you know, well-designed, well-engineered, maybe rough prototype phase, and then use that to pitch an angel round. Maybe get a small round of funding from there to take you through production and then raise a crowdfunding round on, on Kickstarter and Indiegogo to pay for your production run. Maybe you look to develop the technology to a point where you've got a nice enough prototype that you want to uh, file a patent and then pitch that concept to a manufacturer that's in the space that they will then take it and produce it. Either way, even if you're doing that, that means you have to have a very well-engineered, very well-thought-out design because you're not selling the prototype to somebody. You're selling the design to somebody, which they want to just plug into their manufacturers. And these companies aren't in the interest of developing it. They want to buy people who have developed it and have proven it to market. So keep in mind, even when you're looking at the investment route, the first thing to understand from that is the further you push the product yourself, the exponentially higher the probability that somebody will trust you and invest in you. It's not about just about the idea. It's about the execution of the idea. So the key is to design it well, get it to the point where you are essentially tapped out or you choose that, you know, I don't want to spend any more than this, then get investors on board. The further you push it, the exponentially more money you're going to get for, the, for far less equity that you give up. The earlier that you get an investor on board, the much more money they're going to want, to, or the much more equity they're going to want to take for their money. Meaning you're going to be giving up more than half your business before you've even started. So it's, it, it's better essentially to push it further along the path as much as possible. All remember going back to the initial concept, 
How do I get it on the pathway at least at a minimum or to production so that it can be sold to real users at the end who whip out their credit card and then go online and say, I love this product. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I, I totally agree. And I think even from my perspective, like, you know, I run a digital marketing uh, agency, like I mentioned before, and we deal with a lot of customers in the e-commerce space. And a lot of that is, is getting their product to market and scaling and getting those sales through it. We're seeing a shift now, even in marketing agencies, and we're even considering um, going this route as well, where the agencies that are taking over the marketing for these e-com brands are starting to offer funding. They're starting to offer the opportunity to say, hey, you know, we'll put X amount of dollars in to fund the continued scale of the company, of the product sales, um, in exchange for X amount of equity or royalties or whatever. Um, and, you know, we do that as marketing agencies. The reason why that's happening is because when a product's already gone to market and we start seeing those sales comes in, it's very valuable because it's very easy to predict. Like we know what we got to spend to see what we're going to get back. And that's a great, at that point, everyone wants to invest, right? And so usually marketing agencies are the first ones that get to see that and say, okay, this thing's about to blow up. You know, let me put up this much money into it. We'll take it to the next level because we already have that proof of concept. But before that proof of concept happens, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so if someone was to invest in a company that's, you know, not to market yet or not selling or even have some base level of data of, you know, what's customer acquisition cost, for example, it's a massive risk. I'm going to want half of that company or more for very little money just to take that gamble because who knows, it goes to market, doesn't sell and the whole thing flops. But once, like you said, it goes to market and product starts moving and we can predict acquisition costs and we can predict uh, and project scale. It makes a lot of sense. And so I, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, inventors and founders should wait till that point. So that brings me to my, my next question. So what you guys do is obviously invaluable because you're going to help them navigate this whole stage and get them to that point where they have a viable product. So my next question is going to be at what stage in all of that, should they come to you? What is the right moment that they should be emailing you or calling you guys to work with a firm like yours? I appreciate the, qu uh, the question. And I'll first get to something that you said uh, before jumping into what we do to help sure. with that process. But something that you mentioned that I think all hardware startups need to hear that was one of the things that I kind of mentioned early on in terms of manufacturing is you don't, especially as a hardware startup or an inventor or a small e-commerce brand, you don't need to sell a lot of units. The point the, the, where the investors or the companies or the brands or the resellers or the wholesalers all they want to see is a tiny bit of social proof because all of them understand that you're not a sales expert. You're not somebody who is, ex you are the innovator. You are the idea. You're the one who came up with the brilliance, the product. You're the one who worked to, 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 with, you know, to design and engineer and get it to the point where production. So it, it is the way you want it. And it's this beautiful thing that solves this pain point or, or creates this opportunity that you're making. But they understand that you're, you're not in the business. You're not a 50 year old uh, company that's been selling hundreds of millions of dollars of products for, for, for all that time, all they need to see is a tiny bit of proof. And from that proof, they understand through their network, they can amplify that a hundred times the size. And that's exactly, Darren, what you're mentioning. And you're seeing it on the marketing side. I see it on the development side. And it's a, an amazingly powerful thing for an inventor to think about because when you can get, even if you just sell you know, 200 units and you get a handful of reviews online for people saying, I bought this, I, I was willing to buy this thing. So they actually whipped out their credit card. They made the purchase. You delivered on that purchase. Then they got the product and they said, you know what, this thing's fantastic. This really solves a pain point. I think of a very simple example of ours, one of our clients, Clasp Magic. It allows you to put on a bracelet one-handed. There are a lot of people who struggle with this and Alison Brett came up with this great solution that we, of course, had to then engineer. She figured out the idea and, and the, the, even just the basic preliminary concept. And then we went and figured out how to actually engineer it to make this thing work. And, and, it's, and it's brilliant, right? So now she's got all these reviews of all these people all over the world, even just in her first initial sales, saying, this is the greatest thing. I've had this bracelet sitting on my shelf for 20 years. I, it's too much of a pain to put it on or it's sore. I've got arthritis. It, it's painful to do it. And now all of a sudden I've got this thing. You know, my granddaughter gave it to me, whatever. Amazing stories, amazing reviews, but you only need a few of them. And then from there, what happens is you start compounding that. So if you decide to grow the business yourself, which a lot of people start to do at that point because they start seeing the power of their product, is you can now talk to bigger wholesalers, distributors, go direct to retailers, uh, you get in bed with marketing companies, Darren, like yours that are, uh, and, and others that are, uh, that are out there that are offering, you know, help scale for you, or at least helping with the advice. All this sort of stuff is very powerful, but you need to get those first few people to say that they love your product. So the thing that, you know, back to, <laughs> back to your question, 
the thing that we do as a design firm is uh, first and foremost, the earlier, the better. If you've got an invention idea to come to us, because the earlier we can, we can, even if it's just for free advice or info or guidance or whatever, the, 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 the earlier, the better. We take somebody from like a rough sketch on a napkin, which we quite literally get all the way through the design, engineering, prototyping, and into their first production run. We can even connect them up with companies like LaunchBoom, which is the largest crowdfunding agency in the world for distributing product, or Retail Bound, which gets clients directly into retail stores uh, on launch. Companies like this that essentially can get you your first few sales, which is what we're talking about here. We cover the hard part, which is the hardcore design and engineering. We are just looking for the people with the ideas and the, the will to actually do it right and get a product to market. That, that is the key. That is the short of it. And um, you know, something that we can, we can do if you're still in that early, early research phase, um, I would still recommend just give us a call. But if you're still wanting to kind of vet out your idea and think about it, we run the industry, by far the industry's largest podcast, the Product Startup Podcast. I host it myself. We've got hundreds and hundreds of articles on our website at macodesign.com, M-A-K-O design.com, which has every different piece of the design and patenting and engineering and prototyping and manufacturing and selling process. So anything that you have specific interest in, go there, look at a bunch of examples. And of course, on our website, uh, you could just reach out and contact us on any social media platform. And we're happy to have a personal consult to actually look at your product and see what makes most sense from there. But again, back to the first thing that I said in terms of my advice, just start working on it one way or another just start the process set aside a few hours a week and get at it whether it's calling us or whether it's just doing your research at home either way is good whatever you want to do next whatever you're prioritizing next just get to the point and do it you've heard it now here on this podcast there's no reason not to just sketch this down in your calendar right now so that you get working on your project at least looking at it even if you come to the decision that it's not for you you will never feel bad about it if you put in the time to get to that decision. You will absolutely feel bad about it if you procrastinate it. Yeah, 100% agree. And that's the biggest part with entrepreneurship in general. There's just a lot of people that don't get started. They don't take that first step. Um, you know, they think themselves out of it. And it's that whole paralysis by analysis deal. They overthink it. They find all the reasons they can't do it or they're scared to do it or they're not ready to do it. Um, but you're right. I mean, it definitely separates you from the crowd when you just take that first step and do it. And I think, you know, people are very lucky to have companies um, like yours in the marketplace now that can support that and, and provide the resources and know-how um, that maybe wasn't as readily available, like you said, 10 years ago, when these kinds of firms are only working with these massive Fortune 500s. Um, but now they have companies like yours they can rely on. So going back to, to your business and that process, because I think a lot of people will be very interested in this. And I'm, I'm sure someone's listening right now going, okay, yeah, yeah I have an idea. I got a call. How's this going to work? Um, so when they go to work with you, you know, from, from how you guys service clients, which avenue do you guys take? Is there an option where it's, you know, it's just, it, it's flat rate fees where clients are paying you to get through this work, to do the design process and, and all that? Or is there an element of you guys partnering with these inventors where you're either sharing the patents or you're going and we're like, how does that structure work in terms of a compensation structure? Um, uh, the whole, the whole money part, like, what do I need if I'm going to work with you? I think is going to be the obvious question. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we don't take any piece of any client's product ever. One of the interesting things about working in the startup sphere is that uh, we, you have a lot of people, especially some people, we literally get calls of people that said they've been sitting on their idea for 10 years and they haven't trusted anybody with anything. <laughs> so we are like excessively over the top, uh, almost unnecessarily over the top ethical because it, it we are dealing with people's entire like their hopes and their dreams of the one that one key like i say that one key golden ticket that they believe in and this is for many of our clients they're hoping it's going to be the business that is the rest of their lives and that's why we don't take any risk not only do we not own any piece of any project i personally don't own any piece of any project and none of our staff can own any piece of any project so it keeps it extremely transparent, zero conflict of interest. We work exclusively for clients that come to us and we have no outside interest other than that. Our entire interest is simply the client's product and the client's product success. There's never any overlap, never anything else. The way that we do it in terms of fee structure and everything is very unique because we're working with startups. Like I mentioned, many startups are cash crunched or trying to get to a certain object. So we're very flexible and kind of creative in terms of how we spend a budget to what deliverables to get them to the very necessary, not just product step, but business step. 
So a lot of the times it's, okay, we need to get to X, like we were talking about earlier as a rough example. We want to get to a rough prototype with the engineering done. We want the internal electronics to be working well. And then we want to put together a pitch deck of some beautiful renderings of how it's going to look. And we're going to go out and try and raise you know, our next level of funding. So we have to kind of work backwards from that and say, okay, well, what do we need to do to kind of fill that picture in? On the flip side, we do have a lot of clients that are, they want to go to production. They want to do it themselves. They don't yet want to give up equity until they're making sales because obviously at that point you can raise a ton more money, as I mentioned before, for much less equity. If you can afford to do that, or if you have friends and family that can help with that, that's always advisable to, to get at that, that phase. Of course, as a design firm, we love if you raise an investment round, but also, again, my primary interest is the client. I don't want you to give up too much too early when I know that you could have got it to a certain point and then raised a lot more, which could help carry you a lot further in the future. The other thing that I would mention as well in terms of clients and something that's a bit unique of the way we work with clients is one of the biggest problems with inventors is feature creep. Too many ideas going into their first launch. I own a design firm. The more complicated your product is, the more money we make. And yet you will hear it right now and you'll hear it across our podcast when I'm doing keynotes and everything else. I adamantly tell startups to start with a very simple, but very high quality version of your product. And I say this for two reasons. Simple is because you want to take all of your ideas and really focus on the one or two features that you identified as a major pain point you're solving. Whether it connects to an app, has LEDs, has multiple sizes, all this sort of stuff, you can save that as your business evolves down the road and you have much more money to put into that work as almost any startup, even if you're well-funded, you will have cash limitations. So the easiest thing that you can do is mitigate that on your first product launch. You could always add product features down the road, but it's very hard if you don't have enough budget to get to production on your first product to then work backwards and try and fix those errors. I mentioned the, as well the simplicity because it's not only because it's less expensive to develop, but it's faster to get to market, much less manufacturing defects, much easier for your customers to understand. Thus, Darren, for your marketing company, it's a lot easier for you to sell because you can focus really aggressively on those one or two features to the people worldwide of seven plus billion people who are looking for exactly those features, just the limited set, which is a massive audience. Very rarely will you tap that out in your first go. So don't worry about audience size because even if you go after a tiny niche within a niche of the market, it's still worldwide a massive market. And it'll take you a long time to get there. And if you do do that, you'll be a multimillionaire. So don't worry about being too narrow. But on the flip side, if you look at it from uh, a product development standpoint, everything becomes easier as well for you. You really become focused on ensuring that that one or two features that you do have is done at an extremely high level of quality because hardware is very different than software or services. Hardware must be done right the first time must be done to a global caliber and will only have one shot when you go to market with those reviews that come back. So you really want to make sure that your, your simple product is done very, very well so that when you go to market, people absolutely love it. It looks sexy. It's modern. It's very clean. It's easy to use. It's well thought out. It's well engineered because you focused all of your efforts on one or two key features and then the people who wanted those one or two key features are going to be raving fans. Those people are the ones that are going to amplify your message so that when you want to raise more money or when you want to scale up your business or when you want to sell or you want to license a product or you want a white label, you've got all these raving fans, even if it's just a handful of them, but raving fans who loved the way that you executed on those one or two features. That will then allow you to get a lot more money, get a lot more traction, get a lot more sales to then come back to us for developing your pro version or your different size version or a regional version or whatever you want to do, or even just accessories or whatnot, that stuff can come later and down the road. If you focused well on your first part and executed well on getting that to market. Yeah. Well, I can hundred percent confirm that from the marketing standpoint, um, simple, simple is better knowing exactly what you're, you're trying to build and who you're building it for and starting simple, you know, one thing, one key feature, what's, what's the problem you're solving? Because, that makes it so much easier to market, so much easier to find your customer, so much easier to just come up with that clear value proposition. And then, like you said, once you have proof of concept, once you have sales, once you have customers, you have the ability, you have the capital, you have the market to go innovate further. The next step, and the next step, and the next step. 
and build it out. I see too many people try to do all of it at once. They have this huge concept and they want to build all these different products in this huge line and they're all complex. That's really hard to take to market, nothing in scale, right? Um, so I, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. So on that note, let, let's talk about industry trends. I mean, you have your, your finger on the pulse, I'm sure. Um, you know, being that you're working with all these different companies and you're seeing what succeeds and what doesn't succeed industry wise or product category wise, what are you seeing right now as kind of one of the biggest trends where there's a lot of people winning in a particular space or is there even one? Oh, for sure. I mean, first of all, hardware products in general, especially in the startup sphere is growing like crazy. It's one of the fastest growing industries in the world, but to get even more narrow than that is the uh, health and wellness products are just booming right now. And it's across the board, whether it's, um, you know, cannabis products to fitness products to alternative medicine products to uh, home um, analysis products where you're taking kind of medical things that might be reserved for the hospital setting and making a consumer version, which, you know, they could test something at home, temperature uh, analysis of certain things or whatever else. We've got a ton of products on the go right now in, in all kinds of different health and wellness spheres. And it's a very aggressively funded and a very successful vertical right now. So, uh, and, and you know, not to say that that's the only one. I mean, there's lots of verticals that are growing. Uh, home products are, are massive right now, uh, just because the amount of people that are saying, oh, people are like just sitting at home and coming up with ideas for their house or things that were annoying them that they didn't have before. And then they're looking for solutions. So they're going on to Amazon, they're going on to whatever else and saying, uh, you know, I need to find a new smart uh, thermostat for this room, which I never use, but it's annoying because it, it's, you know, it's a different temperature than the rest of the house. Okay, well, here's a list of products there. So the home products business becomes of COVID really exploded. Uh, and then of course you've got, uh, uh, you know, any, anything really to do, uh, not necessarily, and I, I, I don't necessarily want to say the word medical because a medical device itself, a certified medical device is very expensive. It means that it can be used by a clinician, uh, but more health and wellness device is the key that most startups go with because you, it doesn't go through all the regulatory bodies. So something simple, something safe, something that could be, you still have to go through, if it has electronics, you have to go through those certifications. If it doesn't have electronics, a lot of times it's just an accessory or, or as long as there's not a safety issue at hand, it's fairly easy to get to market without going through all those regulatory hoops. So really looking at anything in those space. And then of course you have all this emerging tech which is like, like, even look at Bit, like physical Bitcoin wallets, ways to uh, protect, you know, obviously Bitcoin and, and, and that whole industry is a massive uh, trend. And uh, there's a whole series of accessories that always come along with these trends. And the people who are coming up with the ideas behind these, these industries early now, as they're, uh, you know, emerging or maturing or whatever else, it's the people who are coming up with those ideas now that in three, five, 10 years will be big brands. And so the sooner that you can get in, if you have something that is kind of trend specific, the better. If you have something that you think is going to last the test of time, um, you know, when we were talking about health and wellness products, a lot of people obviously came up with COVID ideas and hygiene ideas. Those are never going to go away. COVID may or may, may not uh, go away. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to guess on that. But what we do know is that hygiene is here forever. And it is the, the level of hygiene and the acute awareness of hygiene has increased substantially. So although COVID, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, rolls out potentially at some point in time, it's still worth investing in those products because it could be another 10, 20, 30 years of it being very fresh in people's minds and the consumers thinking about that as, as an emerging trend. Uh, another emerging industry, obviously, is fintech and anything around financial services. Again, there's a lot of hardware products that come along with this sort of thing. Uh, gaming tech is another big one that's pretty aggressive right now because of the new integration of essentially your body and the visual world. Obviously, Meta is the biggest uh, buzzword right now for that field, but there will be thousands and thousands and thousands of hardware opportunities that allow the physical world to integrate with the digital world. So if you're coming up, I mentioned a lot of these, it's, it's to essentially incite the imagination as you're going through your day-to-day -day life. Think about what the future may or may not bring. Be the early pioneer. In fact, your product ideally is so early that there's not even a lot of buyers yet, but there's a sum. And those start growing over time. You will be the first mover. You will have that first mover advantage, right? Early, always in, in hardware, the earlier, the better. Yeah, I also agree. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And I mean, with that note, you mentioned a lot of product ideas there that, that obviously incorporate some form of software um, or, or yeah, software technology. Is that something you guys help people navigate too? Even if like, let's say I'm an inventor and I don't have a background and I say, 
hey, I have this idea, like you mentioned for, for the metaverse, for example, I have an idea of a particular kind of bodysuit or a glove or helmet that I want to be able to do this and this and this in this version of this world. Um, here's what it could look like. Here's kind of how I think I want to interact. But I don't have any technology experience. Can you guys also help from that standpoint, from software development or connecting to software development firms? Is that something you navigate as well? Well, half of our products have electronics in them. And I would say half of those electronics have some kind of app, software, et cetera, integration. So that's quite normal. In fact, and it'll be more normal. What I would suggest in the next probably 20 years, uh, if you look around the room right now, wherever you're sitting uh, as a listener, almost everything that you touch and see around you will have an embedded and connected microchip in it. Whether it's something very simple, like the chair you're sitting on might tell you when the cushion it needs to be replaced, or whether it's more complicated, like the Nest thermostat sitting on your wall. One way or another, everything is getting connected. And I can tell you, we have a ton of IoT, a ton of connected devices that are relatively simple things that we can use very cheap, very inexpensive, modular, very, fairly easy to design around chips to give us some data and information about anything around us. So as those chips evolve, as the technologies evolve, more inventors and ideators are going to come up with new ideas to help improve the stuff that they see around the room in, in, in their room on their day-to-day -day lives. So absolutely, uh, software and hardware is merging together. That's part of the reason I, I mentioned earlier that VC funding and, and, and up the chain from there is getting more and more involved in hardware. It's also not coincidental that hardware is getting more and more integrated with software. But a lot of inventions that happen have absolutely nothing to do with electronics as well. So I don't want to leave that side of the room out, sure. right? Whatever what hardware is, you know, has options for both and whatever your idea is, one is not necessarily better than the other. In fact, you know, electronics are more expensive, more difficult, more time consuming to develop uh, on average in general. So if you can start with a simple version and then create a connected version later, again, with a concept of, and actually a slogan we have right at our firm, brilliantly simple design, sticking with the concept of simplicity and not feature creeping, always start with your simpler version first and then evolve it from there. Yep, I, I totally agree. It's funny because when you, when you mentioned like coming back to just physical products that are not technology-based, I'm thinking of this, this mug I have here, which is Mammoth Mug. And I mean, whoever came up with this was a, was a genius. And these things I see at like every gym and everyone's hands, like they're everywhere. And it's, it's, it's a water bottle, but someone at some point thought I need a little more water. I need a better shape. I need something more. Or gonna, there was some sort of need that was found with this. And these guys have blown completely up and it's just a plastic water bottle. Right. So it doesn't always have to be overcomplicated or over technological for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've done a handful of water bottles. Um, we did the Feskin water bottle and it was, it's literally just a easier it's for club goers. It's got finger grips. It's just a wicked water bottle for mm -hmm. uh, people who are either interested in, in fitness or interested in the club or, or somehow both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but it was, yeah. it's, it's some of those simple ideas could just explode and become big. I think of another client of ours, the tri plunger. This was his idea. He said, toilet bowl, the holes in toilets now are primarily triangular shaped. Mm -hmm. Why do we have round plungers for the old style toilet bowls? That was the entirety of the idea oh, yeah. that he came to us with. And we designed it super simple to start, uh, not only for the design, but also for manufacturing. We wanted it really easy, real simple. It had a wooden handle on it even. Uh, it, he wanted the traditional look, but it had to have this new design. And uh, it's, that's all it was. It's a funny, actually, side story here. The way he first sold that first batch of units was just walking into this co-op wholesaler. Uh, it's a store and basically a massive retail store and saying, can I talk to the manager? I want to sell this box of plungers. <laughs> of course, the lady at the front thought he was nuts, but he bugged her enough. And he's a nice guy. And sure enough, let him talk to the manager. The manager says, this is really not how we do things. But you know what? I have a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of budget that I can purchase some local items that I choose for my own store that I manage. And he bought his first box. Well, the plungers ended up selling so well that this ended up spreading to a bunch of the other store locations. And it really is the best toilet plunger for a modern shaped triangular toilet bowl. So it just goes to show you the product doesn't have to be overly complicated, but if you can do a good job at nailing the first, you know, your core innovation, uh, then you've got a lot of different ways to move and sell and scale the business from there. Or even if you want, just license it or sell the, the intellectual property as a whole. Once you've proven people are buying it and they love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. That's amazing. I, I love it. I love simplicity. I love when simplicity works and I love when it goes to market and just takes off because it just proves that it's not the complexity of the idea. It's the size of the problem you're solving, the relevancy, the simplicity, like how easy 
can the market understand something? How big of a, of a need are you filling, right? And sometimes you can do that with a very simple product, um, which is amazing. So on that note, one of the last things that's kind of been in the back of my mind that I want to talk about, because it's kind of a bit of a hot topic, especially with, you know, supply chain issues you've been seeing through COVID, things getting stuck, um, you know, shipping coming into the border, ships getting stuck outside of California, not being able to come through. When it comes to making products, obviously the word making implying manufacturing, what are your feelings between manufacturing overseas versus manufacturing domestically or locally? Um, and kind of maybe what are some of the pros and cons and what are the trends you're seeing in terms of what startups are choosing to do? Well, that's actually an easy answer for me. I give you some kind of deep insight into terms of where the, in, the industry is going that uh, is not very well known. And that is around the concept of additive local manufacturing. This is a game changer for inventors. And this is something that is, a, there's a whole list of reasons why you should develop your product idea like now, <laughs> given that the heat of the industry and everything. But in addition to that, one of the beautiful things that's happening right now, we're working with a number of facilities, some of these multi mega million dollar facilities that are putting entire buildings in dedicated to short run manufacturing, meaning 50, 100, maybe 500 units to test your product to the market before you spend big bucks on expensive tooling and molds and shipping logistics and all that to manufacture either overseas or locally. This is one of the big things which is going to bring back a lot of especially early innovative manufacturing, intellectual property manufacturing, the real important stuff having the intellectual property here, the value here, the, the, the feedback here, the companies here locally in Canada and the USA, having that stuff done so that you can get to market, you can get those first few users at a lower cost and with the ability to adjust and tweak and refine. So it's a very con uh, popular concept, as you would know, in software, it's called you know, agile development. It's a big buzz term. It means you know, iterative design essentially over time that is now slowly starting to apply to hardware where you can come out with your one or two core awesome features, get it to market with a, let's say hundred units, have those units be sold, get real feedback from customers on what they liked, what they didn't like and what ideas they have. And then through that feedback, you make your next version of the product or slight improvements or slight tweaks, or maybe it was a hit and you don't touch it and you continue on from there. That is one of the best ways where you can, th th that, not only can an inventor bring business here, but a lot of business is going to be brought here because of the time it takes to go to market, the reduced upfront costs as opposed to paying for the tooling and the ability for quick iterative feedback as it goes. So that above all trends, I think is really important for hardware startups to know about and something that we are working with a number of our clients on to test that first you know, small unit run of their product before they get to the big multi-thousand unit production runs once they have some sales. And ideally at that point, they've now made the actual commitments to the bigger orders. So they're not paying for them anymore. They're getting an order for 10,000 units. And then they're using that order, uh, either if they got the money for it up front, or even if they just got the commitment, they can then get very simple, very easy bridge financing to cover the you know, four month difference in, in time. And they've already got the buyer lined up specifically for the quantity of units they're going to produce. You're making money now. Right. And that is a beautiful thing. And that can, you know, lead to even bigger scale for a business at that point in time. It's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Cause I think that's something that's been on a lot of people's minds is just figuring out that manufacturing piece. And um, it's easy to think too far into it. And I think I, I love that. Like that local manufacturing is, I mean, just to get that proof of concept out and get that low production run out is, is amazing because I've seen horror stories. Like I, I had a, a client a while back that was in the yoga space and uh, she started kind of as a more service and education based business, but she got at the product and she ended up developing a very specific line of like yoga apparel. Um, and at first uh, started doing some local manufacturing. She thought it was going great. So she put her first big order in. She didn't have a whole lot of capital. She put everything she had into it. It was almost a $50,000 order um, coming from China. This was right before the pandemic hit. Everything shut down. That order never showed up. They couldn't track it. Um, and it was a nightmare. And I think that, that's a fear that a lot of people have is taking that leap. You know, when is the right time? So I think definitely relying on local early on can be a great strategy. Um, if the cost makes sense and if the market can support it, then, you know, 100%. I, I love it. Well, and I would say something just to add to that before yeah. we move on is that, especially when you're dealing with even, even what you think is a relatively simple hardware product, 
before you take a product to a producer, whether that be local or overseas, that thing must be designed, engineered, prototype, tested, reprototyped, retested, perfected. Then all your manufacturing specification documents put together. We'll put together an entire sheet of all the, the bill of materials, exactly what those materials data sheets need to have on them, exactly how the product is engineered, exactly how we want the parts put together, the CAD files underlying all those sorts of things so that they can use those to actually make the tools themselves. Every single detail needs to be flushed out, figured out, tested out locally before you're moving to a producer. And that's whether it's onshore or offshore production, it must be done. And unfortunately, some people look at that the other way around and say, well, I'm going to send it to the manufacturer, tell them my idea, yeah. and somehow they're going to figure it all out. It's yeah. impossible to do that. It almost never works. All of the horror stories you hear about that yeah. are almost entirely around that theme other than straight up scams, which you know, may happen. So you have to be careful too uh, on, the, on the production side, especially overseas. But it's very difficult. Um, there's so many details in a product, even a relatively simple one. And even with great experts on, on involved, it takes time, it takes effort to really flush it out and make it great. That's what's so valuable in the prototyping phase. It, the clients love the prototype because they have the shiny thing, they can market it, they can start making some sales, raise investment money. Engineers like that, prototype phase because we could beat the heck out of it and figure out what's not working well on it. That's how a product goes from being okay to being good. That's the difference between something that's at the dollar store and something that's, you know, premium five-star review on Amazon. It's that time and detail in the prototyping and, or even multiple prototyping phases to really flush out and perfect the quality of ideally your one or two key feature sets before you ever take it to a manufacturer because the manufacturer has got enough details to sort out on how to press out every part. Parts are complicated. They're, they're all weird and unusual. You look around you and you say, well, yeah, pretty much anything that you come up with can be made. That's not true. Everything that you see around you, all those different products, there was a heck of a lot of time that went into figuring out all these weird situations to say, how can we produce 10,000 units of each one of these parts at a time and put them all together? All this crazy underlying detail work happening. So what you don't want to be doing is having manufacturing, figuring that out and simultaneously trying to figure out all your random new ideas at the time as well, or what you think they should know. Impossible. Our engineers need to be working, or whoever your design firm's engineers, need to be working with their manufacturing engineers to ensure that they don't change almost anything unless it's for very good reason based on the production process. And that's what creates a great product in production. And even then, look at the best producers in the world. Look at Apple. Every year, they make a new and improved version of their product. Even the best producers with the biggest budgets still over time will tweak and iterate and improve and make every year, you know, better than the year prior. That's still something that, especially that will happen at the startup levels as you get user feedback to what your next product would be, what your next accessory would be, what an improvement could be, et cetera, as you build the business and, and grow that value to your firm, right? And to your product. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's crazy because as you're talking about all this, I can just see your passion. I mean, you're not just someone that's doing this because it's a job or you fell into it, but you can see how passionate, how much energy you have. Um, and I think someone that's looking for a firm to help with the things that you guys do, this is the prime example of what you should be looking for. If someone has this kind of energy, this kind of passion, um, you know, so I appreciate that as I'm sure all your customers do. So what's, what's next for, for Maco design and invent what's coming from the pipeline? Where are you guys heading? You know what? I actually don't want to change much. <laughs> I, I really like what we've built to this point in time. I just want to do more of it. And I really, I'm, my most passionate thing that I'm, I'm doing right now is the community stuff. And that's the reason I'm on this podcast. It's the reason I host my own podcast and doing the keynotes. That stuff is really cool because we now are at the point in the industry where we get some media attention and we actually have the ability to help startups who maybe I'd never heard about this or maybe never knew it was an option to actually get their invention idea to, to be a profitable business for them. We can help educate and guide them along the way. And that is something that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, especially at this, at this scale and the size that we're at, um, you know, I've done nothing but this my entire life. This has been my one and only, um, my one and only career path, my one and only business from incorporating university to full time out of it uh, back in 2007 and until today. Right. So uh, I love seeing the, the, the small folks in the hardware space compete in the, in the big picture and then, and then win in their products. And we can help them with that. So that to me is, is what really drives that passion. And the best thing that I can do to really help the most amount of people in this space, in, our, in my little piece in the world that I operate, 
is uh, is on the educational side. So that's why I do all that. I teach the Master's of Engineering program at Ryerson University for nice. commercializing product, um, podcasts, all those other things. So that to me is is very exciting stuff. But I'm I'm to the point with the business now where I just want to you know our, our concept of perpetual improvement in, in internally is always going to exist. But I don't really want to kind of shoot for the moon and risk it all again, as I did through my 20s to get it to where, where it was today, exactly. which was kind of the vision I wanted for it um, back when I started in high school, right? So yeah, that's where we're at. When you find something that works, you don't mess with it. <laughs> I, love it. it. I love that. Yeah, because it's quite a barrier to, to build a successful business the way you have. There's quite a lot you have to overcome. When you go through those challenges and you go through those ups and downs, you go through that journey um, and it works, you just hang on to it and keep doing what you're doing um, and you enjoy that. Right. So I, I love that. That's a great answer. So very well before, said, Darren. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? Let's just run everyone through that one more time. Well, for anyone that's, uh, that's on your show, Darren, I'm happy to, I'll connect with anybody who adds me a LinkedIn. If you want to reach out to me directly, and even if you want to look over a project, I'm happy to do that. That is, that is the beauty of where I'm at is that I, I get to kind of look at cool new invention ideas uh, every day. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that, um, especially for your audience base. So feel free to do that on LinkedIn. If you want to just learn more about the product development industry on the podcast, as I mentioned before, the Product Startup Podcast. And our blog's on the website at macodesign.com, M-A-K-O design.com. Ton of information on there. And of course, if you do have a product idea, we will do a completely free consultation. Look at the product, look at the strategy, whatever direction you choose, no strings attached. At a bare minimum, I would say at least put that on your priority list to make that call. And one way or another, at least you'll, you'll have some strong guidance and strong direction. And even if it's not something that we can directly help out with, at a bare minimum, I tell our product strategists, and it's very important to, to the message that we have in and around education to, at a minimum, at least guide people in the right direction, guide them to the right resources, do what we have to do. That's playing our small part in the industry to you know, give a small amount of, of free advice here and there. And uh, that's the easiest thing we can do, at least to, to get people going. Of course, if it is a good fit, that's great. I look forward to it. I love that. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else did, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Darren, thank you. Much appreciated for having me on the show. Awesome. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.